Grina Talks about sustainability and transformation. A Grina podcast episode. Welcome to Kreiner Talks. This is our podcast about sustainability and transformation. And to transform our society and our economy, it takes all of us. Businesses, consumers, science, media and so on. But of course, especially important is politics. So I'm very happy that I'm connected to Maria Spiraki, member of the European Parliament for the European People's Party. Hi, Maria, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Maria, you are currently in Brussels. I am in Vienna and we are connected remotely. So my apology in advance to our listeners if the sound quality is not as good as we would like it to be. But we are trying our best. Corona makes quite a few things in life more complicated at the moment. Maria, as a politician, you are used to taking decisions on a daily basis. So to get to know you as a person, may I ask you to take some simple decisions as a start? Simple decision. Changing the mindset that I consume, changing the way that I am traveling and changing the way that I am trying to teach my children. So let's take that on an example. Assume that you are traveling from Brussels to Vienna. Are you taking the night train or the airplane? I vote for the night train and I adore trains. I use it in Strasbourg, from Brussels to Strasbourg. I use it from traveling from Brussels to Germany. And I think that it is the proper way that we have to travel within the EU, especially when trains are upgrading themselves. And when you are ordering food at the restaurant, do you go for the option with meat or the vegetarian option? I'm trying to combine them both. I think that it's not time to, to exclude meat from, from our nutrition, but it is time to increase vegetarian options. Speaking of politics, are you voting for more or less regulations? I think that uh, we need regulations at the European level in order to streamline our efforts for tracking climate change and for, for increasing sustainability. At the same time, we don't need any further regulation when it comes to our regions, to our member states, because I think that one street does not fit to all. And on a very general level, innovation or tradition? Innovation. I'm fully supportive on innovation. I'm also the awarded member for 2019 on research and innovation, focusing on circular economy. So innovation, innovation, innovation. I was hoping for that answer. <laughs> Maria, since 2014, you are a member of the European Parliament for the European People's Party. Before that, you worked as a journalist for Greek media for many years. What got you into politics and what are your ambitions as a politician? Well, since uh, 2014 I was elected, I was trying to understand how the EU is working for the benefit of the people and also for the benefit of our people in Greece. I think one of the issues that I am in politics is that we have to reduce poverty at all levels. And I think that it is important to start with energy poverty because it is one of the, of the main causes that more than 50 million people in the EU are suffering. And we have all the instruments we can tackle it. We have the instruments for deep renovation. According to the Green Deal, it is important to have a very, a very strong renovation wave with a lot of money backing it, with a lot of funding backing it, not only coming from, from EU sources, but also coming from, from IB sources and also coming from the private sector. It is also important to, to upgrade the air quality in urban areas. It is important to upgrade the air quality in rural areas. It is important to upgrade the external environment of, of the areas that people are suffering from energy poverty. So if you ask me what is the motivation for myself in order to, to, to forward to sustainable goals, I think that uh, uh, we have to understand that sustainable goals is something that is global, but uh, sometimes we have to, to, to downgrade it and to, to put it on the table and to take a look on our, on our constituencies, on our countries. And in this regard, my first, my first target is to, to tackle energy poverty and to, to change the way that people are consuming. And as you're already mentioning in your function, you're dealing with many different topics. For example, clean energy, also circular economy and sustainability, as you have elaborated are particularly important to you. Perhaps the most important decision in this area is the EU Green Deal. It was presented about one year ago in late 2019. And my question to you, 
What is the Green Deal all about? Is it the game changer that we need? Indeed, it is. I fully agree with you. It is a game changer because allow me to, to describe the four, the four parliaments that I strongly believe that they are here with the Green Deal. The first one is the way we produce. We have to produce with less energy, energy that it comes from renewable systems. The second one is how can we consume? We have to consume in terms of recyclable uh, products, in terms of, of products that they could be reusable. The third is the way that we work. We have to, to reduce the, the sources that we use in, in terms of work. And at the same time, we have to increase the level of digitalization without, uh, uh, without uh, cutting the opportunities to have personal and physical touches. And of course, the, the, the last but not least is the way that we are approaching the whole environment. It is the way that we, we have to change the narrative. It is the way that we have to change our mindset. Uh, that, that's why I think that the Green Deal is a revolution in terms not only of legislation, but in terms of a global paradigm. And in this regard, I think that the European Union could be and must be and will be the pioneer in the world. And for our listeners who are not so familiar with the Green Deal, can you explain a little bit of what are the key targets, the key goals? Indeed. Well, we are trying to, to work together at the different levels in order to, to reduce greenhouse gas emission at least 55% by 2030 comparing uh, with the greenhouse emission that we had in, in 1990. At the end of the day, by 2050, we will have a fully decarbonized economy. Zero waste economy, zero uh, carbon economy in terms of consuming energy. So it is a very, very ambitious target. But at the same time, I think I would like to explain that uh, legislation is working as a locomotive in terms of production and changing the, produ the production model. And that's why we need a kind of combination. It is not only the production, it is also the consumption. It is also the way that people are engaging in this regard. And of course, is the way that we approach the whole environment and the way that we, we think that our planet is not something that we can have a second one, an alternative one. Surely, climate, il n'y a pas de plan B, car il n'y a pas de planète B, said Emmanuel Macron. And I fully insist on this. It is the, the motto that I strongly support. From my perspective, it is clear that a change towards sustainability would be impossible without political commitment. What is the role of regulations to create a sustainable economy in Europe? Do we need even stronger regulations? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, yes, and, and, and now I will use the, the so-called success story when it comes to, to the single-use plastic directive. When we start discussing on single-use plastic directive, no one believes that we can finally ban single-use plastic, 10, 10 kinds of single-use plastic, including uh, straws, etc. But now we are at, at the level of starting implementing this kind of European legislation. And the member states are open in order to adapt this kind of legislation. My country, Greece, is, is in the forefront of the adoption of this kind of legislation. And it is a, a way that we, we are addressing the needs of the people, because people are now waiting for, for a new model of consumption, and people are now very familiar with the consequences of uh, overconsumption of single-use plastics. They know, but finally, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, they can find microplastics within their fruits, within their cars. And it is important to understand that for, for, we have to, to, to ban it because we have to reduce the use of single-use plastic. Single-use plastic is a perfect keyword for my next question. For us, as a plastics producing company, one of our major goals is to become a fully circular business by 2030. Now, of course, we can contribute to make this change happen, but we will not be able to make it happen on our own because the entire system needs to be transformed. What is the EU doing to make circular economy a reality? Mm -hmm. Yes, you know that uh, now we are discussing and we are proceeding with this legislation on the Circular Economy Action Plan number two. And it is important to facilitate companies and organizations like yours in order to proceed with circularity. I think that, uh, especially on the plastic sector, there are two main options. The first one is that the plastic circulation is, at this period of time, a marginal economical activity. 
And I think that it is important to understand, but it's not something that it is profitable. The first one is this. So you need a lot, we need much more schemes that they are extended producer responsibility schemes in order to increase the quality and the quantity of the plastics that we have to recycle. And second, we need a market-based model in terms of, of refunding concerning consumers in order to motivate consumers to, to give back the plastic bottles and the other plastic uh, packaging. So the first one is this. And the second one, of course, is that we need infrastructures. The infrastructures that are they are of paramount importance in order to implement our not only the, the, the directive on single use plastic, but also to make circularity in the plastics sector a mainstream activity. A mainstream activity and a profitable activity. You have mentioned the amount of recycled plastic. And we can see that circular business models are quite often not profitable at the moment. If you look at plastics, for instance, you will see that recycling is more expensive than using virgin materials at the moment. So the industry is kind of stuck in a linear system. How do you plan to tackle this? By incentivizing the industry to, to transform itself. And I think that is one of the, of the reasons that I, I insist on the engagement of the consumer is that uh, if the demand for, for recyclable products are higher, then the profitability will increase. If the demand remains at the same level, then the profitability will remain low. That's why I think that first we have to incentivize this is the, the industry in order to become much more circular. And second, we have to engage consumer. I think for, for the youth, it is, it's much more easier because they are more sensitive in terms of, of protecting the environment. And at the same time, they are more demanding On products uh, for, from the side of the industry, they have to communicate also and to, to engage with the, with the consumer in order to explain that by having a recyclable uh, uh, package, it will be for the benefit not only for the industry, not only for the consumer, but also for, this, for the environment and finally for our health. And what kind of incentives are you planning for the industry? I think that it is at the level of the member states to start giving some kind of, uh, of tax incentives in order to start uh, uh, promoting circularity. And I fully support these kind of measures because I think that it is time now to change our model by, by using all the available instruments. And of course, I insist on the, on the issue of the lending policy because it is the taxonomy that it gives a lot of opportunities in terms of changing the technology and create a more, much more greener sector in plastics in the whole EU, and also the lending policy when it comes from the European Investment Bank. These two pillars, I think that they are very important. And what kind of advice would you give an international company like Kreiner? What kind of advice to accelerate that transformation to, towards circular economy? It is important to become a pioneer. It is important to become a leader in your sector. So keep circular. And I think by keeping circular and communicating circular, communicating the need that there is now existing in terms of circular economy, in terms of circular product, you will finally succeed your target and you will increase your profitability. We have to target your audience. We have to target your consumer. And of course, we have to, to become engaged in this regard. Speaking of our audience, what role do you see for the consumer when it comes to sustainability? I personally believe that we have to increase the transparency when it comes to environmental and social impacts of our consumption. How can we contribute? How can the EU contribute? Indeed, yes. Transparency is, is a main pillar in this regard. But I think that we have to, to explain to the consumers We don't need to explore more. We don't need to consume more. We don't need to consume more energy. We don't need to have more. We, we need to reuse. We need to recycle. And finally, we need to change our everyday life model. Working in the field of sustainability can be very exciting. It can also be very challenging. And sometimes it can be a little bit frustrating because we know the solutions but the change is simply not happening fast enough. So two final questions for you. What is sustainability for you personally? And what keeps you motivated to keep going, to keep making positive change? Sustainability for me is uh, to, to start uh, my day with uh, looking for something fresh, from something that it comes from the nature and not something that, which is artificial. 
continuing for the going to work by using uh, my bike and uh, going back by using my bike as well and trying to have uh, an everyday life that is it is reducing energy consumption but it is trying to change the the model that I used to live before starting engaging with this very important and very global effort and sustainability for me also is for my personal reason it is the way that uh, I will work and I'm still working on on tackling energy poverty. And when you're facing obstacles or when you're facing setbacks, what keeps you motivated to keep making this kind of positive change? I like to to read and sometimes to to, to take a look at some videos concerning best practices. I adore success. And I think that when you assist, you will finally have the proper result. Uh, talking about energy poverty, I have uh, a story when it comes to, to how can we tackle energy poverty coming from, from the year in Paris. They finally succeed to transform 6,000 flats and they finally succeed to, to, to give 5,000 new jobs. So it is important to insist and it is important to proceed with best practices without losing faith. I think this is my motto. We have to insist, of course, a lot of obstacles we will face. That's why we are in politics and we are not in paradise. Let's hope that we are successful with our transformation towards sustainability. Maria, thank you so much for taking your time. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to discuss with you this hot topic. Thank you. That was Kreiner Talks with Maria Spiraki. Thank you for listening. Stay healthy and subscribe to our podcast. Griner Talks, a Griner podcast. Subscribe now.